we're going to have uh, two speakers, from one from Scripps, one from Pinanel. Dr. John Veronek is going to go first. He's going to talk about a new research vessel that we're in the process of building here for PNNL. It's a hybrid, plug-in hybrid electric research vessel. Will be the first of its kind in DOE's fleet. And John will uh, describe that process and why we're excited about that new vessel. And then Dr. Bruce Applegate from Scripps will talk about their recent hydrogen hybrid research vessel they've commissioned and the process towards uh, building that out. And before we get to John and Bruce, Tim Ramsey from the Department of Energy Water Power Technologies Office has agreed to give us a quick kickoff uh, and tell us a bit about why DOE has funded this new hybrid research vessel at PNNL and broadly talk about the value of collaborations in the ocean science space. Before Tim goes, just a couple housekeeping items. We only have about an hour today, so I'm going to let our speakers present, and then we're gonna to move to a Q&A following the presentations. As you're thinking about questions during the presentations, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we're not gonna interrupt the speakers with, with raised hands and questions. When we get to the Q&A, feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you, but we're gonna to try to let, let the presentations go and then keep the Q&A to the end. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I'll hand it over to you, Tim, to kick us off. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I appreciate that. And I'll keep it short. I just had a few words to say. But first, I just want to say, you know, thank you. Thank you for setting this up. Thank you for inviting us. And thank you uh, to everyone out there on the webinar that's uh, uh, listening in today. Um, the marine energy industry is small and there's a lot of work to do. And, and it's partnerships like this and collaborations like this where we can leverage each other, work together. That's really going to advance and push the, uh, the industry forward. You know, the saying goes that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I really do believe in that. And it's and it's partnerships like this that are really going to have a big impact, especially partnerships with our national labs and, and our universities out there. Um, so this MOU that you guys have signed, this partnership that PNNL and Scripps um, are working on together is, is fantastic. And, and from my view, really great to see. And, and this webinar series that you guys have put together, uh, a great way to share that information. And, um, and you really did pick a great first topic around uh, research vessels. Obviously, we've been working with PNNL. We know uh, more about the uh, the hybrid research vessel that uh, that you guys are developing. Uh, the vessel by itself is a great um, asset. It will be a great asset for advancing marine energy and, and marine energy and testing tidal uh, technologies and developing new sensors. Um, but to be able to do that in an environmentally friendly way, reducing our carbon footprint, um, showing that. Uh, uh, operations and cost of operations, especially in the long term, can be reduced uh, is really a, a fantastic and exciting opportunity and a win-win. And, and, and it shows that DOE is putting their money where their mouth is and that we're not just about the research. We want to do the research and showcase and prove that the research can be done uh, in, in a way that's environmentally friendly and, and sustainable. So really excited about this topic, um, especially excited to hear more about uh, what Scripps is doing. Um, like I said, we've been working with PNNL, working with you guys, but uh, excited to hear more today about um, the Scripps vessel, the research vessel, and what they're doing in marine energy and what they're doing in high, um, hydrogen and, and fuel cell research and find other areas of collaborations and ways that we can work together. And, and this webinar series that you guys have set up, it's great. It's great that you're not just talking to each other. I mean, sharing collaborating together is fantastic, but then taking a step further and sharing that information, that collaboration out to the general public uh, really is, is uh, um, uh, great to see. And I, I commend you for that. So again, thank you for inviting us to participate and allowing us to be here. And, and uh, thank you all for attending today and look forward to, to uh, the discussion. Appreciate it. That's great. Thank you so much, Tim. And it's so exciting. I, you know, the Water Power Technologies Office in DOE focuses in on marine energy, but through your blue economy missions, you've really been able to make partnerships across the ocean science and technology space. And, you know, the investment in the research vessel is a good example of that, but also working on solutions for providing energy and power for ocean observing technologies. There's a lot of work that's happening in DOE water power that's broadly supportive of the ocean technology and ocean science industry and community. So thank you for your leadership on that. And with that, I think we're gonna get started. And I'd like to hand it over to Dr. John Veronek from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And John will be talking about our new hybrid plug-in research vessel. And John, if you'd like to introduce yourself 
uh, take it away. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, my name is John Varenick, and I'm one of the uh, researchers here at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'm a marine ecologist. Uh, I'm also the dive officer for our lab and one of the senior vessel operators. And I'm, for the purposes of this talk, um, one of the reasons I'm giving it is I'm also the technical oversight representative on our boat. So sort of dealing with the operational side of making sure we have what we need uh, during the build. Um, before I get into the national labs and stuff like that, I just wanted to point out in this picture, uh, there's a picture of our dock on Squim Bay, but right here, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is, is a new this new vessel that we've been talking about, which is new to our research fleet. Um, our fleet is relatively small with a bunch of coastal uh, vessels. Um, the Desdemona here is our largest one at 34 foot, so this new vessel is going to be a substantial increase to the capabilities that we have here, um, just to give you an idea of where we're starting from and, and where we're going to be going. Um, the, uh, like I said, I'm part of the Pacific Northwest National Lab, which is up here in Washington State. Um, the National Lab System with Department of Energy was started uh, with three labs with Oak Ridge, uh, Los Alamos, and, and Hanford, which became PNNL uh, around World War II, um, but has expanded since then to about 17 laboratories and sort of deals with very specific mission spaces throughout the uh, throughout the lab trying to I mean, throughout the lab system to to look at the na nation's uh, problems and, and ways to find them. Uh, we are actually located, I'm actually located on the Olympic Peninsula uh, in PNNL Squim in our Squim campus, which is the uh, only marine lab in the DOE uh, national lab system. Uh, our lab is located right on the mouth of Squim Bay. So this is the picture that I showed before down here and we have an Uplands campus, but we are right on, this is Squim Bay. Uh, we are right on the mouth of Squim Bay and which gives us, which affords us an awful lot of opportunities for field research. So we take our, our research from the, the tabletop to the, to the field uh, to really be able to, to expand what we can do. Um, these different colored areas are different permitted areas that we have to, to work. So we have pre-permitted test beds that allow us to, to do a lot of our testing and research. Um, and I'll point out that this is, this is the Olympic Peninsula here. We're at the end of this arrow. And later on in the talk, I'll talk about this little spot over here, which is Port Angeles, um, for those at Scripps to uh, pay attention to. Uh, but we're only 12 miles away or 11 miles away from, from the BRICS uh, which is formerly Armstrong Shipyard in Port Angeles. Um, but the location, in addition to the scientists that we have here, the location is incredible for being able to, to do the research that we want to do. Um, so in addition to the PNNL in general is very large and has varied mission spaces from electrical grid stability and resilience to ecological impact of, of uh, infrastructure and, and things that are going on in the country to national security. But one of the things that uh, we do a lot here, especially here at the, at the labs in, in SQUIM in, in Seattle are try to further the mission for the Department of Energy in, in promoting marine energy. Our mission space is not to create the devices, um, you know, like whether they're, they're wave or tidal, uh, but to help promote the, you know, we don't want to com compete with commercial interests, but we're he here to help promote that technology, uh, whether we're testing it, uh, technical support for the development of it, integration of those systems in, in with other systems, uh, looking a lot at the environmental impacts, uh, potential environmental impacts of these systems, and also policy discussions, you know, how do we want to integrate these systems into smaller communities or blue economy or, or, or however. So our mission space covers a lot of different areas of the marine energy world that Tim was talking about um, as, as a subset of, of the overall work that we do at PNNL. Uh, the Water Power Technology Office supports this in a number of ways there, uh, that, that we are involved with. So they have direct awards to developers to try to um, incentivize the, 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 the development of these. Um, PNNL gets direct support to help those developers. So we will get uh, paid directly from uh, the Department of Energy to uh, help test, help develop uh, things alongside the developers. We also get directed research uh, money to look at these environmental impacts or develop sensors that look at environmental impacts or site analysis, things like that. And then Water Power Technology Office is also funding internships at PNNL uh, related to the marine energy. 
one of the big things that leads directly to the talk is the Water Power Technology Office is also investing in infrastructure here at the National Lab to help support this research and, and technology development. And so the, the specifically what we are going to talk about today is this new hybrid ves uh, research vessel that we're going to be building. Um, <clears throat> I will say that when we knew we were getting this, when we were, when we were applying for the infrastructure money to do this, uh, one of the things that we did was look around it at other options that were out there and look at what people have been doing. And one of the things that really came up in our uh, our 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 research was looking at the coastal the newest coastal research vessel that Scripps has, um, the RV Bob and Betty Beister. Uh, and I have to shout out to Brett and the rest of the Scripps team that helped with us because they not only answered questions in the beginning of what the capabilities of the vessel were. But we've actually been on the vessel. We've talked about how to operate, how it works operationally, what design things work, what don't work, so we can further fine tune um, our our vessel and the specifications for it. Um, one of the things, though, that that we were looking specifically for our vessel is this needs to be a purpose built built vessel. We love to have a demonstration vessel that can go all over the world on on electric power and be able to show the wonders of electric power. But first and foremost, we need this to be an operational working vessel. And so foremost in our in our design uh, was this deploy, you know, the ability to deploy and retrieve these these devices that we're testing to use as a sensor platform and a dive platform and support all the research that we're doing while also being a demonstration project that shows that we're trying we're committed to reducing co2 emissions and um, improving the the way we go about our business um, and eventually this will also be a, a platform for testing technologies uh, for example pnnl develops battery technologies or advances to battery technologies and and potentially this vessel could be a testing spot for those types of of advancements to further our energy density on the vessel and extend our range and capabilities and things like that so the 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 vessel needed to be operationally sound in addition to having these other devices that we needed so we put it out to uh, we we came up with a specification list and put it out to a competitive bid and the result is this hybrid electric uh, diesel electric it's a hybrid diesel electric uh, catamaran style hull um, that we've named the RB Resilience um, and this is currently in the in the in the beginning stages of being constructed here in Seattle. So it's being built by Snow and Company um, who is doing a fantastic job trying to meet the uh, meet, meet the mission specifications that we have for the vessel. So all the operational things that we're trying to do, trying to get this into what's turning out to be a very complicated design because of her size and what we're asking her to do. Um, the whole design is uh, by Inca Crowler. Uh, she's going to be powered by uh, Volvo Penta diesel engines and have Danforth uh, Editron electric motors. So both drivetrains. Uh, and the and the and the electrical storage is going to be provided by a Spear Power Systems uh, Trident battery system, which is very complex, uh, but has the ability to to hold and store over 100 kilowatt hours of of power. So fairly dense amount of electricity in a vessel this size, and and still be operational to do the work that we need her to do. Uh, in terms of capability, capabilities and specifications, uh, she's going to be 50 feet long. So like I said, she's going to be substantially bigger than the, the largest coastal vessel we have in our fleet. She's going to have a 16-foot beam, which is somewhat limited by the, um, by the marina that we're going to be keeping her in, and a very shallow draft for a vessel her size to be able to do the near shore work that we do. Um, she's going to have lifting capabilities to allow us for those deployments that we were talking about, in addition to a number, as you can see here, the list, but a number of, of specifications that help us meet the research goals that we have to do, including research grade GPSs and dedicated dry lab space and, and electrical connections for the deck and, and things like that. Um, so the boat should be very capable to meet most of the requirements that we have for the for the research that we do here in Squim Bay and around the Puget Sound and and elsewhere in the Salish Sea. Um, in terms of propulsion, like I said, she's got a hybrid drive, which is the first in the Department of Energy fleet. Uh, if she's running on diesel, she'll be able to cruise at 21 knots, uh, sprint to up to 28 knots, which is very fast for a research vessel. 
Um, and each of those diesel engines can produce a fair amount of energy for charging the electric engine, which will uh, electric battery system, which we'll get to. If she's running on electric, she should be able to do uh, six knots. There's some indication in the curves that we're looking at now that she'll be able to do more than six knots. And we've asked for at least four hours um, of operation research operations on the electric power before we have to recharge her. Uh, depending on the operations, it could be longer than that. Um, but of course, it depends on the energy drain with the scientific loads that we have and how fast we're going. Uh, but what this hybrid drive does is it allows us the flexibility to meet the mission needs. So if we need to get somewhere fast, we've got those diesel engines to cruise at much faster speeds. If we need um, more silent operations because we're doing acoustic work or if we're around wildlife, um, we have those electric capabilities. Um, even just staying on station, uh, we can use the electric power to, to, to motor around on station, which reduces our CO2 emissions. Uh, the, the, the nice thing that the silent operations and the CO reduced uh, emissions do is it also makes a, a more pleasant environment for the researchers. Uh, most of us have been on vessels that have really stinky diesel exhaust or are really loud and you're yelling to, to hear things as we're doing our research. And so this will make a much nicer platform for the researchers as well as the environment around us. Um, and then also it's a, it's it's potentially uh, having the hybrid drive gives us that test platform for integration that I was talking about. Testing new technologies, see how this works, learn from our operations to see uh, as as more vessels of this class are being designed and built what can be approved on and hopefully help the fleet in general, the, the global fleet uh, with, with better performance and integration of these systems. Uh, the charging modes uh, is really flexible um, by design. Uh, it can accept anywhere from 110 to 460 volt inputs, uh, single phase or three phase. Uh, in general, we have three modes of charging. We can sort of what they call like a trickle charge, slow charging mode, which would be at most of the marinas that we're at, which have very limited electrical flow on. So just your traditional shore power, which will probably take, you know, almost a day to charge fully if, if we needed to. Um, but it could take a standard 110 volt uh, plug from, from a marina and charge our engines. The faster chargers that we have are going to be on the diesel engines, which should only take a couple hours for a full charge, uh, especially to get up to like 80, 85%, we can do very quickly. And then to get that last little bit sort of takes a little bit more. Uh, and then also we're making a fast charger at the PNNL SQUIM dock that in that picture that I showed you in the first, uh, as part of this uh, IRIS project, which I'll talk about in a second, um, which will have the ability to do very fast charging of the vessel also, so we can um, uh, come in for lunch, charge up the vessel, get back out, do our work if we're working here in Swim Bay, and, and theoretically have a charge in a couple hours. Uh, one of the nice things about this IRIS project is it's part of a larger, a, a larger system that will use things like renewable energy, like the solar tidal turbines, uh, have a battery bank to store that and then be able to uh, put out that energy into a number of, of uh, applications. So docks are charging for our vessel being one of them, but we could have things like uh, autonomous ve vehicles, we can have sensors, we can have uh, vehicle charging at the lab. Um, but having this integrated system that allows us to use renewable energy in a lot of different ways very efficiently, to store it very efficiently. Uh, so this is part of a larger project, this integrated renewable energy system, this IRIS system at the lab that's going to be going on. The, 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 the project uh, is, is, has been very, very challenging. And I keep mentioning the fact that a vessel this size, uh, one of the problems that we're running into uh, or that, that we've had to overcome, I should say, I think, I think Snow is doing a really good job doing this, is um, we have weight limitations for a vessel this size. If you're working with a little skiff runabout and you want to put an electric engine on it, you can have a, a single 12 volt battery and put it on there and run your little electric trolling motor and, and go around. And it's not a problem. And if you have a really big ferry that's 100 feet or 200 feet, you've got plenty of buoyancy for a big battery bank to run it all electric. Problem is, is in this sort of 50 foot range, we're sort of in between where we need a fair amount of power to run her, but 
we have limitations in the amount of buoyancy that we need, especially if we're trying to do things with her. We want to be able to hold 5,000 pounds. We want to have scientists. We want to have research, research equipment. So, so there are these weight limitations that we've been dealing with, at how much the batteries weigh versus what are our operational loads. Um, the battery system is complex where it's, it weighs a lot. It takes up a lot of space. It has to be integrated with the scientific systems. It has to be integrated with the propulsion, with all these different multiple charging modes, which uh, was an interesting issue. Um, there's also worries about the, uh, or the concerns about the batteries and potential fires. Uh, so we have a, a really robust fire suppression system and, um, and venting system in the, in the system. And as far as I know, it's one of the only vessels that has an A60 uh, rating, fire rating, which means it can have a, it can hold a fire in the battery compartment room for 60 minutes without, without busting through. So, so there's a lot of safety, robust safety things that have gone into this boat to help make it safe. Um, one of the other challenges is the operational modes. We've got these really fast diesel cruising speeds, but we also have really slow electric engine sort of research speeds that we want to do and getting things like props that'll work really well and efficiently in both of those scenarios is, is difficult. And then as with the rest of the world, we're dealing with things like supply chain issues and material costs escalating, staffing at subcontractors, and Snow's been doing a really good, Snow and Company has been doing a really good job of mitigating these things. Um, but these are all just challenges that have been part of this system. It's, it's a first of its kind, as far as we know, and uh, I think we're moving along really well, but, but there have definitely been challenges to address along the process. So in terms of progress, we are just about done with our 90% design phase. Um, they have actually started, they've actually cut all the aluminum and have started tacking it together. This is a picture of the first arc for the first tacking to, to, to start assembling on the, on the jig. Um, we expect this vessel to be completed June 2023 at this point and expect to take delivery of her in, in the early July uh, after the acceptance testing and, and sea trials and things of that nature. So, so she's not right around the corner, but for a, for a build like this, she's right around the corner for us and we, we're anticipating being able to use her in the, at the end of the summer next year, which, is, which would be incredible. So the, you know, to, to summarize, the the fact that we are getting with the support of uh, the Department of Energy this system that is integrated with the IRA system that that the state of Washington is is helping fund, um, we're getting this this first of class first of kind you know medium sized research vessel to be able to to work here in the Salish Sea, have the range to work throughout Puget Sound, um, all the way down to the Columbia River need be, uh, can also start supporting our offshore wind projects, but having this, this greatly increases our capability to be able to do the work that we want to do. And uh, like Simon said, we'll save questions for the end after uh, Bruce does, does his talk. But thank you. Great. Thank you so much, John. That was an awesome overview. Uh, and I haven't seen any questions coming in yet from the chat, but I have about four of them written down. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the Q&A, no, what, what, no matter what happens here. So thank you for, for kicking this off and providing that um, initial presentation. And now we're going to turn to Bruce to talk more about Scripps Vessel. So Bruce, the, the floor is yours. All right, great. You should be seeing a picture of ships. Yep, they're up there. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bruce Applegate. I'm the Associate Director at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And uh, boy, that was just a fantastic presentation, John. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing this vessel as it comes to fruition, because you know, a lot of what you talked about is, is exactly the, the, the kind of issue that we face on a little bit larger scale, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. And, and our, our uh, projects that we're embarking on to, to build a zero emission capable coastal class research vessel, which is a, is scales, scales what you just talked about up, up, up a bit. Um, so, so yeah, today I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about um, why we, we've uh, selected, uh, selected zero emission as an approach to, to recapitalize our smallest ship. The, the picture here shows our marine facility in Point Loma, uh, the Scripps Nimitz Marine Facility where we keep our ships. And um, this is uh, also where the Beister is home ported. Um, so just a, a, a quick note of support. Um, a, a lot of what I talk about today represents support that we've received from the Department of Transportation Maritime Administration, 
uh, as, uh, as well as uh, operational support that we get from the National Science Foundation and the Office of Naval Research. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about has been a, 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 the outcome of a, a collaborative effort uh, from a fantastic group of people at uh, Sandia National Laboratories, Gloucester, our naval architect, and uh, the initial feasibility studies were done with DNV as our class society. Um, but the, the, the point of what we're about to embark on is really to, to replace a scientific research vessel, the Robert Gordon Sproul, it's our little workhorse, it's scripts. It provides the way that uh, our, our scientists and students get out to sea reliably in San Diego. Um, the rest of our fleet is shown on, on the right here. Um, you can see our, our ocean class vessel, Sally Ride, and our global class, Roger Ravel, which are owned by the Office of Naval Research, but operated by us and our, our, our coastal work boat, the Beister. Um, Sproul has a special role for us because whereas the Sally Ride and the Roger Ravel are frequently away from San Diego for months, even years at a time. Sproul is always here for us. So our students, our researchers doing work in Southern California re rely on Sproul and it's an important part of our institution. And it's old, it's more than 40 years old now. And <laughs> that's really old for a research vessel, even though we've, we've taken super good care of it, it's, it's time to replace it. So we've been uh, looking at ways to do that. and. Just a bit of context for you. You're probably aware of a lot of the, the, the work that we do at Scripps, but, but for more than 100 years, we've been operating research vessels that go all over the world. Uh, the world is our office. And um, we've, we've uh, also had an impact on, on, on the world as we've traveled around. Uh, and uh, you're probably all familiar with uh, the Keeling curve. Charles Keeling, a Scripps scientist, began measuring CO2 at Mauna Loa. And the time series is now known as the Keeling curve showing the, the increase in atmospheric CO2, largely due to anthropogenic uh, burning of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you think of that in the context of the US academic research fleet um, and how we've contributed to CO2 emissions, uh, superimposed on the curve here is a, a series of vertical lines that show the introductions into the US academic research fleet of oceanographic research vessels some of them are pointed out, the names of them on the top there. Uh, and when they were introduced into the fleet uh, in terms of uh, where we were on the Keeling curve. And each of these vessels uses diesel, so burning fossil fuels um, as its propulsion power source. And you know, over the course of this time, the, the US fleet has, has put out almost nine, uh, well, almost 10 billion pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. And at Scripps, our share of that is, is we, we burn more than a million and a half gallons of diesel fuel a year right now, uh, which is uh, you know 36 million pounds of CO2 a year. So clearly a place like Scripps, uh, we wanna do it cleaner and better than, than everybody. And, and we're very concerned about our contribution to greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions. Um, on a more local scale, if you look at where the, the, the Robert Gordon Sproul usually operates, it's uh, reliably here in San Diego where we operate. And a lot of the work that we do is in the Southern California Bight, although we go up and down uh, the California coast as well. Uh, and in addition to the carbon emissions that we're concerned about, diesel fuel um, results in criteria pollutants and diesel particulate matter that uh, are harmful to human health. And, if you think of the impact of marine shipping in Southern California and its impact on, on human health, um, the series of maps here shows this same area, the Southern California region. And with, with the impacts of some of these criteria pollutants plotted over them. So the bottom two panels show two of these criteria pollutants, NO, NO2 and, and particulates. And um, this shows just the contribution contribution from ships. So this doesn't include anything that's that's emitted on land from transportation or industry or anything else. This is just the maritime contribution. And you see these uh, these accumulations of pollutants offshore where you'd expect them, that's where the ships are. but but those pollutants all uh, waft their way into the LA basin due to the uh, onshore flow where more than fourteen million people live. So, uh, all of these things are detrimental to human health. They cause smog. Uh, diesel particulate matter is, is particularly bad. And so from an from environmental sense, I mean, our ships are contributing not just to, to, to carbon, which has a global impact, but significant impacts on our port adjacent communities and people that live even far inland in terms of criteria pollutants. 
So that really was um, something that we factored in heavily when we thought about how we're going to recapitalize our, our little ship, Robert Gordon Sproul, we needed to replace it. So in addition to those uh, sort of uh, imperatives, uh, the University of California issued a carbon neutrality uh, mission uh, to try to be carbon neutral by 2025. And as the single biggest user of diesel fuel in the UC system, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do my best to meet that. Um, but a little bit uh, that John uh, pointed out in his talk about, you know, there's there's some really neat scientific advantages from being electric. And what we're proposing is electric uh, propulsion for this ship as well. So, um, uh, you know, just like electric cars, you've got the potential for operating super quietly, which is great for, as John said, you know, the people on deck, you don't have to listen to that, but it's also good for for what happens underwater with low radiated noise, uh, you increase your signal to noise ratio uh, because you're decreasing your radiated noise. So you get better acoustics. And a lot of what we do underwater, of course, has to do with acoustic measurements. Um, but it's also a good thing to generally not contaminate the air and the water that you're trying to sample for scientific reasons. And it's a good thing to not be detrimental to the physical and, bi and, and biological systems that we want to study and, and protect. Um, so there's, there's so obviously there's lots of environmental benefits to being zero emission, but a, a cool one about hydrogen that I like to point out is that if you have a fuel spill with uh, fossil fuels, diesel, uh, you're in for a really bad day. Um, and uh, it has terrible environmental consequences. And as an operator, it's got terrible uh, operational consequences in terms of the reporting and the cleanup and the mitigation and the insurance and whatnot. Um, by contrast, if you if you cracked your entire hydrogen fuel tank open and and the entire contents of that fuel tank hit the deck, it would vaporize within seconds. And hydrogen is buoyant in air, so uh, it would evacuate itself to space at 30 knots. So before you could even get on the phone to call the Coast Guard to tell them that you've got a, a fuel spill, the fuel has cleaned itself up and it's heading up into space in the atmosphere, and it's it's not a greenhouse gas. So it's not contributing to uh, to, to uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, con uh, accumulations. So that that's a really cool thing about hydrogen that we like. So I mean, about 2016, we started thinking about how we're going to replace the Robert Gordon Sproul. And and we asked ourselves, well, gosh, is would it be possible to to create a vessel that's that's a true zero emission vessel? So we embarked on a project with uh, colleagues at Sandia National Laboratory. So um, uh, Lenny Klebanoff and Joe Pratt at Sandia and uh, they're hydrogen experts. We're not, we're ship operators, scientific ship operators. Uh, and we were funded by the Maritime Administration and we uh, partnered with Gloston and DNVGL to, to look into the feasibility of, of building a, a zero emission vessel. And we wanted to look at it from, from every uh, every perspective as a ship operator. So first of all, is it technically feasible? And we wanted to, 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 to use commercially available off-the-shelf parts. Could you buy this stuff and integrate it and, and make it work? But also as an operator, we're super concerned about regulatory framework because currently, and this, this is still true, there's not, a, there's not a regulatory framework in the United States for, for uh, liquid hydrogen, which is a cryogenic fuel. And so that's very much a, a risk factor in building a ship. Uh, but also, you know, could you get enough hydrogen? How would you source it? Is it really, uh, uh, does it you know, make an impact uh, environmentally in terms of uh, CO2? All those questions and, and more we, we asked ourselves and we looked at in the study and uh, skipping right to the conclusion is, yeah, all this was possible. And, uh, and we found that, that there were no red flags to proceeding with the zero emission vessel. And so what you're seeing here is a it's really a it's a, it's a regional class vessel, so this is much bigger than Sproul, and it's more ship than we need. Uh, but we showed that that we could carry enough liquid hydrogen to get our, our full twenty five it's a twenty five hundred nautical mile range out of this, and be able to operate entirely uh, on liquid hydrogen using fuel cells for propulsion power. Uh, and that was a terrific uh, a terrific outcome of this. Um, not so terrific was uh, the cost and the size. Both were much bigger than, than we needed uh, in terms of replacement for Sproul. So, um, so we declared victory on this project, but then we asked ourselves, well, what if we focus just on Sproul, which is a 125-foot vessel? It's a coastal class ship, uh, so a much smaller frame than the 170-foot um, long 50-foot uh, beam vessel I just showed you. 
So we wanted to look at you know basically what's possible with with a vessel like Sproul, and we've got a lot of the same considerations John just talked about in terms of of you know uh, power and range and and the energy budgets needed for those things. Uh, so our approach was really to to take a hull uh, that um, we could use uh, a, so a conceptual design, uh, a 125 foot long hull, and keep that constant, and then swap in different kinds of propulsion systems and, and model those. To, to see what we could get out of them. So, so for a baseline, uh, we, we considered uh, at one end of the spectrum, a conventional diesel electric um, propulsion system, and the other would be 100% uh, hydrogen. We uh, quickly, I think on day one, on the back of an envelope, we realized that, that uh, with the, the, the regulatory framework that we anticipate and the, the volume of hydrogen that we would need to, to get the 2,500, 2,400 nautical mile range that we wanted out of the ship, we simply couldn't carry enough hydrogen on, on this size vessel. So at that point, we really focused on hybrid hybrid approaches. Uh, and so we looked at both battery hybrid and, uh, and a hydrogen hybrid uh, um, variant um, on, on this platform. So our, our role at Scripps, Scripps was to, to advise the team um, of uh, what the science mission requirements were. So uh, the map on the right shows a, a little broader perspective of where Sproul has gone over its, its lifetime. So, and with our scientists, look at not just um, backwards at, at what instrumentation and stuff that we've needed to support our science, but also, you know, projecting forward 10, 20, 30 years, the life of the, of the vessel, you know, what are we going to need on this ship uh, as, to make it a capable scientific research vessel, which is, I mean, which is really what we want. Our scientists want a capable ship that's safe, and that's what we want to build. So um, with that, we, we considered uh, all the different kinds of uh, sensors that we would put on the ship. So this would be a very capable coastal oceanographic research vessel. Um, and we intended it to be part of the academic research fleet. So operating within UNOLS. Um, and based on that, we did, uh, uh, our folks at Gloucester, the engineers there did a series of, uh, 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 ran, ran all the models to, to, to look at um, uh, what the vessel would be like. And, and one of the key outcomes of that uh, feasibility study was that really, um, Hy hydrogen hybrid was far preferable for us for this application than a battery hybrid would be largely because the the range that we could get out of a, a full a full tank of, of hydrogen is almost an order of magnitude better so the, the table here shows that if, if you had a full tank of hydrogen or a, a full charge on a battery bank um, that you could get on this ship uh, at nine knots which would be the uh, the cruising speed uh, for for this vessel uh, you get 37 nautical mile range uh, out of the out of the battery hybrid ver versus 330 out of the hydrogen hybrid, so that was pretty uh, interesting. But uh, a follow-on of that was surprising and very uh, it was a happy conclusion that we learned that we could do 75 percent of our missions entirely as a zero emission vessel uh, with with the hydrogen hybrid. Um, most of the things that we do are, are within a day or so of San Diego, within uh, with, certainly within uh, 300 miles of San Diego. And, uh, and that was a, a great result is that, gosh, even with a hybrid approach, we could do, still do 75% of our missions entirely as a zero emission vessel. Um, so, so a little bit about what, what that would look like, uh, this hybrid vessel, um, the, the, the power system, uh, that we've envisioned uh, would include uh, uh, a liquid hydrogen tank uh, to carry enough liquid hydrogen, and um, that would power uh, a bank of fuel cells, and that would provide uh, the electricity that would then run the electric uh, propulsion of the ship. So th the idea is that you would use that when you're moving away from port, and then uh, in, you know, certainly when you're doing sampling and underway uh, or, or, or scientific operations, uh, if you needed to extend the range of the vessel, you could switch over to, to diesel generators, uh, which we show here uh, on this diagram. And they would drive on this vessel uh, a pair of uh, thrusters at the stern. So, uh, so azimuthine L-drive thrusters. Uh, the, the vessel is also envisioned here with a, with a bow thruster as well. So it would uh, have dynamic positioning capability and um, and uh, be every bit as capable as, as any other modern oceanographic research vessel, and certainly better than a 42-year-old Sproul. Um, most of you may be aware of what uh, fuel cells look like, but I'm a geologist, so I, I had to learn all this stuff. Um, but basically, we would turn a big noisy engine room uh, uh, into what looks more like a computer server room with these racks of fuel cells. 
Um, but uh, the way they work, of course, is, is they bring hydrogen in uh, and these are the PEM fuel cells that we're looking at uh, would uh, combine that with the oxygen and, and air. And what comes out is electricity, a little bit of waste heat and, uh, and some uh, pure water. Uh, so uh, no emissions at the point of use, which is terrific. And uh, that's a key point though, because we really wanna move the needle on, on decreasing the CO2 that we emit. And one of the outcomes of our feasibility studies really showed that, that to, to have a significant impact on the CO2 budget is we need to use green hydrogen. So it's very important. And at the time of the first feasibility study, that was a little bit dismaying, but there's been so much movement in the, the, uh, the hydrogen space with the new efforts uh, ongoing at DOE and in the state of California that I'm, I'm extremely bullish right now. They're getting green hydrogen at a, at a price point that, that's gonna be pretty good in the near future, is, especially in San Diego, is, uh, is, is gonna happen. So, um, these graphs show that that, that really we um, uh, no matter what kind of hydrogen you use uh, the the criteria emissions which are shown here on the left are dramatically better at the point of use uh, uh, with a, a hydrogen fuel cell system and on the right that shows the the co2 um, and the the analysis that we did really looked at the entire production chain from the the production of hydrogen, to the use of hydrogen. So, so on the right side, you do see that there is some CO2 emitted there, uh, but really that's from the assumption that it would be transported to us in trucks that use diesel fuel for transportation fuel. Well, if you knock that out with either a battery truck or a hydrogen truck, that goes almost to zero as well. So um, this is how we move the needle on maritime uh, in terms of getting our reductions down at sea, uh, CO2 and, and criteria emissions. Um, another ha happy outcome was that um, the fuel is readily available uh, nationally, really. Uh, you can get liquid hydrogen uh, all over the place, but certainly in California, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very mature uh, uh, technology in terms of the, the delivery. You can drive a truck of liquid hydrogen on, on the freeway, and that's what's shown on the top left panel here is a delivery being made of liquid hydrogen to one of the hydrogen fueling stations in California. Um, so. Uh, it, the ability to transport liquid hydrogen uh, to the ship using tanker trucks, and then uh, and then fuel bunker the ship uh, is you you can use existing technology with a, a, just a couple of little tweaks to get it on board the ship. So that's a fantastic outcome. Uh, we learned that we could bunker the ship in the sort of the time uh, uh, frame that we currently do with uh, uh, with diesel, so we could fuel it quickly enough. Uh, so. Uh, this is very promising. Uh, and uh, a new development that we just learned about about a month ago is that there's a green hydrogen production facility that's uh, coming online in uh, Casa Grande, Arizona, and they anticipate delivering green liquid hydrogen uh, by next year at, at uh, I think they, they're, they're saying initially at $14 a kilogram, so delivered. So that's a terrific price. And I, I think this is just gonna come down. So. Predicated on all that, we, we pitched this idea to the state of California uh, because the state of California uh, owns the Sproul. And, uh, and based on the outcomes of those feasibility studies, we've been supported by the state of California uh, to, to embark on the, the, uh, the construction of this ship. So they gave us $35 million that we've used now to, to capitalize the design. Um, and uh, once we had that, um, we, we also have proposed to the Office of Naval Research um, because they're interested in sort of the system, system integration and the design of, of this power system. Uh, they're also supporting the, the design of this vessel. So we've got terrific support so far from the state of California and, and the Office of Naval Research. And um, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that <laughs> costs continue to escalate. So this is something that is going to be a continuing work in progress for us. Uh, making sure that we've got the support that we need to, to bring this, this project to, to completion. Um, but here's where we stand now. We're in phase one. We've established a project construction office at Scripps, and we've uh, brought our naval architect, Gloston, on board. Uh, that was a competitive uh, bidding process, and Gloston was the winner. And we've just recently uh, embarked on uh, really a, a refresh of the con conceptual design that they came up for us uh, during the uh, the initial feasibility studies. 
And that's where we stand right now. Um, these are some sort of artistic uh, renderings of what the ship might look like. Um, uh, but really, that I don't have much more in terms of the design to show because we're just getting started on the detailed design. And uh, with that, I'll uh, leave it and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Bruce. That, that, that was an amazing presentation. And we, we do have questions coming in uh, to the chat, which, of course, just disappeared as soon as your presentation went, went away from me here. But um, and John, would, would you mind also joining us on video? Um, I'll give you guys both sort of a virtual round of applause. It's always hard over Zoom, but great presentations from both of you. Um, let's move to the Q&A. We have about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and I am going to try to combine two questions. Um, we had a question on what Congress and elected officials could do to further promote environmentally research vessels uh, and policy changes that could help support development of vessels like this. I know that's kind of a, a tough question, um, but, I'm, but you, you mentioned some challenges around supply chain, around the need for R&D for these kinds of vessels. Um, are the incentive structures right? Are public sector organizations like Scripps and Pinal able to make these acquisitions at sort of acceptable levels of risk? So I am wondering if you guys have thoughts on, um, I guess it's sort of a set of policy challenges, but just some of the challenges that we need to be thinking about institutionally to be able to encourage vessels like this in the future. I'll, I'll take a crack at the first thing, which is one of the, the biggest risks for us right now is really regulatory risk. That um, we're, we, we've had a great dialogue with the uh, US Coast Guard and working with our class societies to establish the, the, the framework for using a, a hydrogen at sea. And, but we're, I mean, we're in super early days. So I, I think focusing uh, effort on, on you know, providing the resources at, the, at, at the, you know, the, the Coast Guard level so that they can quickly and uh, helpfully move this process along, uh, that, that would really uh, help our project a lot. Thanks, Bruce. And John, maybe I'll ask you sort of a specific follow-up on that one. Um, I, I think those of us who work in this space sort of think about these as futuristic technologies that might exist one day, but the reality is you're in an acquisition process to, to buy a vessel like this today. And I am wondering if you can talk a little bit about how easy that was. I mean, you, you talked about it being a complex project, but there are companies out there that are able to supply these technologies, design these vessels today. And I'm just wondering if you can share a little bit about that experience of kind of being on the cutting edge, but maybe this is maybe this is the present edge that we're in. Yeah, like I like I said, I think the problem, some of the, the challenges that we did is there are certainly companies out there. I gave that list of of art, of companies that are are helping us with this build, um, but a lot of them aren't working together necessarily, right? So it's the integration of all those technologies that is difficult, especially in the size vessel that we have. So there are electric ferries for instance you know and people are doing large vessels that way there are you can buy cruising catamarans to go around the world and have electric power from solar and and big banks and stuff like that um, but trying to do this sort of very specific smaller vessel to try to do all these different things and meet all these different requirements that we have for the research is, is sort of where it's gotten difficult. And then some of the supply chain issues have just been what's happening in the world, right? It's just uh, like a lot of the stuff you can imagine requires computer chips for our vessel <laughs> because we're, we're transferring between electrical systems and and trying to monitor all those and all the safety systems. And so that's that's been um, that's been an issue. But uh, Overall, the the other thing in our design specifications, though, was dealing with the lack of infrastructure for some of this. So just like Bruce was talking about, can we even get hydrogen, right? You know, and it turns out San Diego has some of those, some of those uh, infra that infrastructure. Um, we had to be able to plug ours into any old marina. Most marinas don't have a three phase, four sixty or four eighty volt fast charger for us to plug into and so so we have to sort of be able to bridge that gap until the rest of the uh, region can catch up to us. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So many different challenges to address all in a short acquisition period. It's pretty remarkable. Um, I'm looking at the list of questions, and there's a bunch coming in now. Um, and if you two see one that you particularly want to address, feel free to interrupt me. But I was going to switch a little bit from the research perspective. 
we're talking a lot about the carbon perspective and why we might want to do these things from the from we want to reduce emissions, have cleaner operations. But Chris had a question about how the research community can come together. Um, so he asks how he says low or no CO2 vessels are a critical component of our oceanographic research capability. Increasing autonomous systems like USVs, gliders, et cetera, expand that capability and our observational ability in a low carbon way. What is the right forum in the US for the research community to put a comprehensive plan together for these combined capabilities? So thinking about this, these vessels as sort of one of a number of tools in the toolbox for connecting research at sea that could be low carbon. Is there a forum for us to come together, share lessons learned, and kind of sketch that plan out? Or are we doing this one, you know, one at a time in a more ad hoc way? I'll, I'll start. So um this is uh we, we've we've communicated what we're doing broadly through the University National Oceanographic Laboratory System, UNALS. So that is the, the framework through which uh, oceanographers collaborate and it's, it's the mechanism by which uh, our federal sponsors of science at sea uh, schedule ships fairly and transparently to the scientific community. But we also have an active uh, council and we, we consider uh, longer term uh, fleet recapitalization issues and, and such. Um, but that's kind of an echo chamber too. You know, I really think to be really significant, uh, I, I think it would be pretty powerful if the National Academies came down and said, hey, um, the only reason we're not doing this is because we just, we, we've decided so far that we're not gonna. Let's, let's make future ships uh, uh, zero carbon. And, and there's gonna be design impacts. Uh, but I mean, I think what, what we've shown and certainly what naval architects like Austin are showing is that, is that if, if you take certain steps, you can have a fully capable vessel. It might look a little different than what we're used to because of, you know, diesel's terrific. It's, it's super dense and it's uh, at liquid or room temperature and it, it's kind of hard to make it explode. You know, it's a great fuel, but there's other fuels and they can, they can move the needle for us. John, I don't know if you have thoughts on that too. Yeah, I was, you know, I, I don't work at that larger scale, but I would say that I think also some of the relationships that we're forming now, um, you know, like with this MOU with Scripps and PNNL is, is it starts that dialogue sort of at a stage that can hopefully be the demonstration project for other people to follow, right? And so, um, so whether we can get congressional support that sees that it's working, which we're already starting to see, whether it's something like UNOLS taking advantage of it or the Academy saying like, oh yeah, it can be done because Scripps just built this and, and they've got a, a halfway to a design for a larger one if we wanna go all the way around the world with it and stuff like that. And so so I, th I think unfortunately we're probably in the nascent stages of it, but but we're sort of providing that sort of argument to it can't be done, right? Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting to me too because different sectors of the maritime community are working on these issues. So we know that people are looking at electric ferries or hydrogen ferries. And in fact, I live in Bellingham, Washington, and a new hydrogen ferry was built just right down the road from me that's going into service in California. So transportation, we have research vessels, and then you know we're working with colleagues right now on new and emerging uses of ocean space like offshore wind and off the offshore wind industry is trying to figure out what vessels they need to both build and operate those farms going forward and should they be low emission and i think you know if i think about a vessel like yours bruce it's about the size of an offshore wind supply vessel maybe so it's a you know a small ferry similarly speaking so maybe some of these different sectors not just the research sector could also be working together to share lessons learned as well I don't know if you have any thoughts on, do you do you talk to, I know you work with Sandia National Labs who provide some of the, some of the analysis for that uh, hydrogen ferry that I mentioned, but are you working with other groups outside the research community to also understand cutting edge technology here? Yeah, there's, there's a, 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 a consortium Blue Sky Maritime uh, Coalition that, that we are uh, a partner with. And uh, that is a really interesting, mashup of of folks from uh, academia industry that's got representatives from ports so big shipping companies to small operators like scripts uh, all coming together to look at ways to decarbonize 
with the with with the goal together of decarbonizing completely uh, within a, a, a you know a time frame that's achievable, but you know, it's ambitious. But uh, and that's super interesting because we we're, we're learning a lot about um, uh, how how different parts of the maritime industry are moving because it's right now there's no single magic silver bullet to solve this problem. I mean, uh, Maersk, for instance, just announced that they're going to be using methanol on a, a fleet of large carriers. And they've they've inked a deal with a provider who's going to going to produce uh, sustainable uh, synthesized methanol. Well, we're super interested in that, and you know that hadn't really been on our radar when we started this feasibility study. But now we're wondering, hey, what if what if we swapped out the diesel on our ship with methanol? What would that look like? And we're we're actually doing that exercise right now as part of our our design refresh. Yeah, I mean, you could truly have sort of a net zero vessel if you could mix a biofuel with a with a different fuel. And that actually was one of the questions in the chat. Did you consider other sources of fuel? So I think that was a good, thanks for ticking that box. That, that's a really good so, point. I'll just say that we we operated Sproul for a year and a half on 100% renewable diesel. So a drop-in diesel. And uh, and it was terrific, except for the fact that um, the, the criteria pollutants were way higher than what we were getting out of our ultra low sulfur diesel. So from a cost and operational standpoint, it worked great, uh, but we would need to retrofit the ship with a lot more um, emissions uh, gear to, to bring the cleanliness of the exhaust down. So we, we stopped using it, but San Diego is gonna use only, if you're buying commercial fuel in San Diego starting next year, all you'll be able to get is renewable diesel fuel. That's great. We have about one more minute and, and I, I have a couple more questions. I think some of them could be answered in the chat. There was a question on scaling and price. And I guess maybe I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts about being a trailblazer in this space and taking on, if this costs a lot more than traditional technology, how do we kind of get it to scale? Um, and is it worth it? Is the is the process worth it at the end of the day? And I'm, I'm, I'm asking that from the research perspective and also your operational perspective, maybe just, 30 seconds on on some of those topics then we'll have to probably wrap it up today i i would say from our point of view um i don't have the exact numbers but i think that the the hybrid drive added about 40 percent to the cost of the build so it is a substantial increase in in the cost but having said that what's the right thing to do right and and what is worthwhile for that plus we also have those scientific benefits that come from it like bruce spelled out and i, I alluded to so um so I think it's worth it if you can do it, but it was certainly a big hurdle in the beginning before WPTO stepped up and, and offered to help us with the, with the build. And I'll just add that uh, we see similar sorts of cost escalations with the new uh, novel propulsion system, but I, I'll just say that we've shown that it's possible. And what's stopping us now is a little bit of money. And when you think about, the, so there's a moral imperative here. I mean, we're, uh, the, our criteria emissions still, harm human health. People die because of diesel fumes. <laughs> um, and we're driving up the, 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 the temperature of the planet by emitting CO2. I, I think we can do this and we can show the rest of the world. And this is really a role for folks like, uh, like uh, PNL and, and Scripps. I mean, we, we're the kinds of people that can demonstrate this so we can get wider adoption. And that's what I hope to do. It's a great place to leave it. Thank you both so much for your time today. Excellent presentations.